Welcome to this week's message from Cross Life Church. I'm Andrew Portnoy. We do foolish things when we're caught up in resentment. We'll say, I'm going to get him, or I'll show her. Then we do the ridiculous to make that happen. When we give in to resentment, we act in self-destructive ways and hurt ourselves much more than those we're holding grudges against. Like the old comedy act, The Three Stooges, Mo kept hitting Curly on the chest and Curly said, I'm going to get even with that guy. I'm going to stop him. So he took a stick of dynamite and strapped it to his own chest. Then he said, next time he slaps me, it's going to blow his hand off. Well, that's what happens when we're resentful. It never ends with us getting what we want. So why do it? Don't hold on to your resentment. Let it go. Believe God like David did. Let God take care of it his way. He will, and he usually involves you. Here's Pastor Darren with God Never Fails, Leaders Do. Have you noticed that revenge is very rewarding for the movie industry? My wife Kara and I just started watching a new Prime Video series called Terminal List, and it stars Chris Pratt. And three episodes into the series, I finally realized that it's called Terminal List because the list is the names of the people that Chris Pratt's character is going to kill. I won't tell you why and all that, but it has to do with revenge. It's very appealing. It's, it's a trending series, and it's very appealing to people. Uh, it, I mean, the, nearly every Quentin Tarantino movie, the plot is revenge. And it's no coincidence that one of the top film franchises today is connected to the series, the movie series, called The Avengers. See, revenge is very appealing to us. That's why the movie industry gets, makes gobs of money off of movies that are made with revenge and the plot. It's just appealing to our sense of fairness, our sense of finally everyone is getting what they deserve. Except if we're not careful, something terribly evil happens, and it's this. That revenge fantasies and movies turn into fact and murder. It turns into school shootings. And not just that, but it can turn into social media tirades. It can turn into uh, uh, snarky text messages. It can turn into sarcastic slams in a family or among friends that are meant to hurt. We want others to pay. We want them to get what they deserve. Maybe it's the idiot who cut you off on, in the road in traffic. Maybe it's a product manufacturer who won't allow you to get a refund for your failed product. Maybe it's your ex. Maybe it's your irresponsible sister. You know what? We need to realize that, that these are not just plots in Hollywood, but these actually take place in our own hearts and our own homes, our churches, chat rooms, our, our, our classrooms, and our own cul-de-sacs, that revenge is much closer to us than, than Hollywood. It, it's right here. And the reason we run to revenge is because we are victims of injustice. And pay attention here. I think if you're taking notes, I would write something else here. Not just victims of injustice, but victims of perceived injustice. See, and we think revenge will we'll promise it'll just make things right again. It'll make things even. It'll settle the score once and for all. Let me tell you, today my goal is to convince you that that is a big bad lie that comes from the devil because revenge can never settle the score. Revenge hurts the other person. Revenge hurts you. Revenge hurts your relationship with that other person. And revenge hurts your relationship with God. It's only the never-failing love and mercy and forgiveness and power of reconciliation of God that can rescue us from, from injustice, that, that can rescue us and truly, truly put us at peace without needing to settle the score, because it, 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 revenge just can't. And, and that peace and relief that God's never-failing love and forgiveness and mercy and power of reconciliation, that love and peace that that provides for you that relief is so much sweeter than the sin 
of revenge. Today we're going to be looking at David and learning from David's experience after David became a victim of injustice. And and let me just recap here how that happened, how David became a victim of injustice. Uh, David was a young boy who was learning the family trade of, of shepherding when the prophet Samuel shows up and anointed David as successor to the throne of the king of Israel. So David's very young and he's anointed as successor. Problem was, King Saul wasn't dead yet. He was still on the throne, and David would have to wait. So this is like giving an 18-year-old keys to a new Corvette convertible and telling them not to drive it. I mean, that David just had to wait around. And and it seemed that David would take the throne soon, because then what happened is that God rejected King Saul for his bad behavior. We covered that in previous weeks in this series. But still, there wasn't there wasn't a clear exit strategy for Saul. So Saul remained king, and uh, he was just, he was restlessly proud, restlessly paranoid. He invited, he invited the ever-talented David to come and play the harp to soothe his soul, and so David did. David came to play the harp, and it, and it did help. And what was he doing? David was helping a diminishing king stay on the throne. Now, that seems a little odd, but I'm going to get to that in this story. And uh, about the time, then, David, w- David used his shepherding skills to face the giant Goliath and, and drop him with a stone. We talked about that last week. It, all the while, cowardly soldiers and Saul himself watched in fear. And so David became the celebrity, and Saul became jealous. And so here's what Saul did. Saul had this strategy. He was obsessed with this perceived injustice of David being more popular than he was. And so Saul sought revenge. He recruited David to the Israelite army and sent him on these no, no chance, n- no return assignments that were sure to kill him, hm. but they never did. Then one time Saul hurled his spear at an unaware David who was quietly playing the harp in the same room as Saul, and all David did was ducked. He didn't pick up the spear and throw it back, and finally Saul sends assassins to David's house to take him out and that doesn't work. And so then Saul calls his arm and he chases David. He chases David all around. And, and David chooses flight instead of fight. And he ran into the desert and into the hills, leaving the comfort of his home. And David hid in the caves of an area called En Gedi. Saul chased him there with his army. Innocent of all wrongdoing, David was engaged in drama he never asked for, and he became the victim of injustice. That's how it happened. It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. It wasn't what David deserved. A crazy king prevented his career advancement, and even the people around wanted David instead of Saul to be king. So David could legitimately take Saul out and call it self-defense. And how did David respond? I want to show you that now, um, but before I actually show you David's response to this injustice, and before I take you under the pages of Scripture and take you into a cave where David was hiding and King Saul showed up, before we peer into that cave, I just want to help you peer into David's heart. And I want to do that by looking at two psalms that David wrote in the Bible, songs really, And he wrote them while he was being chased by King Saul, while he was hiding in caves. And they tell us a lot about David's heart and his inner beliefs and inner feelings. Here's one of them from Psalm 57. David's writing. He says, I cry out to God most high, to God who saves me. See how David is appealing, not, not to everyone getting what they deserve. He's appealing to God. He knows God can save him. Crowd to God most high who saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. Whose job is it? Whose, whose job is revenge, according to David? It's God's job. God is rebuking those who hotly pursue him. David says, I'm in the midst of lions, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. This, this is hurtful. It's painful. It's real. In the midst of the pain, David says, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. See, it's not about David's enemies. It's not about David. This is about God. Let your glory be over all the earth. See, it's about God. They, David's enemies, dug a pit 
in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. Yeah, and uh, that's what happens with evil. Next one, Psalm 142. David is still writing. David says, when my spirit grows faint within me, it is you, talking to God, it is you who watch over my way. You see that? His confidence is not in revenge. It's in God. He continues, no one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. When you are the victim of injustice, it can, it can feel very lonely. Um, others don't understand. And let me warn you here also, when you're the victim of perceived injustice and others don't seem to understand, it may be because you're the only one who, who doesn't see reality. Um, so there's a, it's a double-edged sword there. Uh, either way, it's a very lonely place. No one cares for my life. David continues, I cry to you, Lord. He's not going to the government. He's not going to take revenge. He's not going home and complaining to his wife. He, he's in communication with the Lord. He's, he says, you are my refuge. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. See that? There's a real problem. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. And that's a real solution. God is the solution. Rescue me, David says. Now, it's not that God is soft on evil. When we're talking about um, staying away from revenge. Not at all. We need to be very accurate and speak biblically about this. Uh, God will ultimately avenge all evil in this world, but unlike the swift vengeance laid out in a two-hour movie or a one-hour episode or even in our own revenge fantasies, the Bible tells us this, that God is a slow avenger. And the Bible describes God in multiple verses with, the, with these words. Listen, slow to anger and abounding in love. That's how the Bible describes God. God's slowness is not weakness, but a sign of perfect, patient love. So God withholds wrath for a time so that people will repent and return to him. And God has, has patiently given you and me that chance. He's withheld his, he's held back his wrath for us in his mercy and in his loving forgiveness. He's held back his wrath on our sins, and now he expects us to do the same for others. Hey, the Bible in Romans chapter 12 says this, do not repay anyone evil for evil. So revenge is never up to us. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Bottom line is this. Take revenge and you sin against God. Because that is not how God has dealt with us. And God does not give us permission to deal with others in any form of revenge. He does not give us permission for swift revenge, for strategized revenge, for social media tirades, for snarky text messages, for sarcasm bombs that drop in the middle of a family or a group of friends. We do not have permit, much less bodily harm, murder, school shootings. We do not have the right from God for revenge. Taking revenge on our own is a sin. Now, David knew this. David knew about this temptation to get even, and that it's, and that, that, that temptation to get even with revenge, David knew that it's filled with lies. So let me show you how this plays out here from 1 Samuel uh, chapter 24, okay? This is the scenario. I'm describing it now as the Bible describes it. David and, his, and some of his men are hiding deep in this cave. They're way back in the cave. It's dark, and David is hiding from crazy King Saul, who is ruining the country, who should really be impeached and deported. And from the dark back shadows of the cave, David and his men hear a man shuffle into the cave to relieve himself. Oh, shh! They, they hush each other and then gasp, Whoa! It's King Saul! Now, so imagine you're David at that moment. Think of all the voices calling out to you with their lies about revenge. Okay, there's the lie of your own human logic. 
that, that you need to pay Saul back for all of the injustice, for all the trouble, okay? The lie of misinterpreting God's words when, when God had David anointed and said, you'll soon be king, misinterpreting those words to mean, well then, obviously that means I should just kill the current king so I can take over. It's a lie. The lie of misinterpreting God's works in history of perfect wisdom and justice because God himself has killed entire cities. He sent fires and earthquakes and plagues on people. So I, I interpret that to mean, well then I can do that too. Sorry, you're not God, that's a lie. How about the lie of friends who are eager to rise to your defense? Because they're your friends. This is your chance, they say. Take him out. And the biggest lie of revenge itself, that it actually will settle the score, that it'll, that it'll make things even, that it'll make it better, that everything will be fine. Do not believe it. The Bible says here in Job chapter 5, verse 2, resentment kills a fool. You know, we just do foolish things when we're caught up in resentment, when we're caught up in revenge. Our counterattacks back against the other person tend to actually backfire on us, and they hurt us. We don't think clearly. We think more about ourselves than others. We think more about hate than love. And, and resentment kills a fool. Resentment backfires on us. I'm thinking of this episode, uh, not of a current series, but of a really classic and old comedy series called The Three Stooges. This is way, this is way back. This is black and white TV. And Larry, Moe, and Curly. And it was slapstick comedy, and these guys were always getting in trouble and, and yucking on each other and uh, uh, just picking on each other. So there's an episode where where Mo is hitting Curly in the chest. Ah, oh, and, and Curly's just getting tired of it. And he's just like, what do I, what do, I do? And, and next time Mo comes up and hits him in the chest. And finally Curly says, I know how I'm going to take care of this. He says, I'll get him. I'll get him. The next time Mo hits me on the chest, I'm going to strap a load of dynamite to my chest. And the next time that he hits me, it'll blow his hand off. And, and in this old ancient comedy show, it actually happens and nobody blows to smithereens, but they're all black and smoky and what happens is that uh, <laughs> uh, Moe's hand doesn't get blown off, but Curly gets all in trouble because of that dynamite he's strapped to his chest. That's how revenge and resentment work. Resentment kills a fool. So why do it? Don't, don't hold on to revenge and resentment. Don't strap it on your chest close to your heart. Let it go. Leave it to God. Let, let God do the work and, and truly believe that. David, David himself believes it. And you know, I have to correct also a misinterpretation, a, a lie of sorts. And that's this. The, the lie is that revenge will actually settle the score and that, that we really want revenge to make things even. Think about this. You, we don't want revenge to make things even. We want, we want revenge to make things better for us. We want revenge to make us feel better, to make us feel superior, and we're not trusting God to do that. Now, here's another surprise. We shouldn't trust God to do that because God is not about making you feel superior or be superior to all the other people. God wants all people to know his love. God wants all people to believe in Jesus. God wants all people to repent and be saved. God wants all people to be his children. See that? He doesn't want any, any of us superior or inferior. And so David wasn't out to get even with Saul or get ahead of Saul. David knew this, and he trusted God to settle the score. When tempted with these voices of resentment and revenge, David resisted. Here's what he said. He said this to, to his buddies who were encouraging him, encouraging him to harm Saul, he said, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. He says that twice in there. So look at these words. Why? They tell us. Why did David work so hard to shut down these voices lying to him about revenge? 
he starts out and he says, the Lord forbid. See, David's relationship with the Lord God guides him more than anything. What God says matters more than your hurt feelings, more than your friend's advice, more than what you see in the movies. Listen to the Lord, the Lord God. Next, David says, my master. He calls Saul my master. Saul is not David's enemy in David's eyes. He's a victim of the enemy, the devil. Now, as a leader, Saul had failed. That's true, but even that does not give David the right to dishonor or to, even, or to kill him. He calls him the Lord's anointed, the anointed of the Lord, two times in there. Saul, David knows this and believes this, Saul is still God's man, Despite his troubles, despite his imperfections, despite his sins, Saul remains the Lord's chosen king until the Lord makes it clear that Saul's reign is over. That's not David's job. That's not David's decision to make. So what does David do? David takes responsibility, not for Saul, but for David. That's what you do when there's injustice. You take responsibility for yourself. David takes responsibility not for Saul, but for David, for what he can control, for his response to Saul and, and Saul's injustice. And so here's what happens. David doesn't react to Saul being in the cave, and Saul eventually shuffles out of the cave. And as Saul and his men are saddling up to get going, David exits the cave, gets Saul's attention, approaches Saul, bows down to King Saul. And then he uses these words. He bows down to, to King Saul, and he, he refers to him. He says, my father. He calls him my father from 1 Samuel 24. That's, those aren't fighting words. That's, that's a term of respect, not retaliation. And then in this scene, David very calmly, very gently, very respectfully lays out evidence of David's own innocence, very respectfully before Saul, to let Saul know, hey, I'm, I, I, it, it's not me. I have not done anything. I'm not a threat against you. And he leaves all judgment and revenge to the Lord God. You might say that David lost the battle of retaliation and revenge, by, by doing that, he won the war of reconciliation. Because here's the rest of the story. Reconciliation. David's love for Saul, here's what happened. Saul acknowledged his sin. Saul affirmed David as, as the heir apparent and the, success, the successor to the throne. And Saul even asks David for mercy. There is the power of of leaving it in the Lord's hands and following God instead of your own hurt heart with revenge. This is the most important piece of all as we're talking about revenge and David's response and Saul's sins. We're talking about our sins that want to be, to settle the score and honestly not get even but be superior. This is more important than all that. It's, it's now centuries later, centuries after David and Saul, and a descendant of David was told that, that he would be on the throne. But, like David, he was persecuted too. He had enemies who could go after him because of perceived injustice, because they believed lies, and they persecuted him. And his name is Jesus. His enemy, the devil, chased him into the wilderness. And Jesus didn't respond with physical violence or retaliation. But like David, he responded with faith in the words of God. We put ourselves in this scenario of, of being in a cave and, and, and Jesus is in the back of the cave and we walk into the cave and we're walking in with, 
uh, all kinds of paranoia about not being treated right and we think there's injustice and we feel that there's a threat. We might even feel sometimes that Jesus himself is a threat to us by taking all the fun out of life, taking things away, not doing things our way. And Jesus is in the, in the shadows of the cave and he could reach out and he could just snap our necks with his pinky. But he doesn't seek revenge. He doesn't retaliate against us for our sins, just like David. No, he cuts a little corner of our conscience away. Like, like David had actually cut a little piece of Saul's robe and Saul was in the cave and, and he showed that to Saul later. And Jesus cuts a little corner of our conscience to get our attention, to show us, I could have snapped your neck there and I didn't. And then he spares us in forgiving mercy. And then like David, went before Saul and bowed down before him with these, not with fighting words, to say, my father, Jesus, comes out and he bows down before us and he gets low and he gets humble and he speaks not fighting words but Jesus in the Bible calls us my friends we're sinners he should be seeking revenge and he bows down and he gets low lower lower than us lower than a prostitute lower than a tax collector lower than the thief on the cross Jesus gets lower than you and, the, and, and me to bow before us all the way to the cross, all the way to death to pay for our sins. And then powerfully, but I'm going to say gently, Jesus proves his innocence by rising from the dead. And what I mean by gently is that Jesus didn't come back to life and then go raid Pontius Pilate's palace and go strike down all the Roman soldiers who killed him. All right? He had something else on his mind. He didn't have revenge and retaliation on his mind when Jesus rose from the dead. He just had evidence on his mind. Evidence that I'm alive, that, that Jesus, what I said would be true, actually became true. And so that, that's the evidence for us that Jesus rose from the dead. And he was able, after he rose from the dead, to approach his disciples who, who wanted to get revenge before he died. Peter, who, who struck the high priest's servant with his sword. And James and John, who wanted to call down fire from heaven on sinners. And Jesus, in his forgiving mercy, did not take revenge on them. But he showed his forgiving mercy, and he shows that on us too. And so now Jesus' expectation is that we do the same. Forgiven and loved by Jesus, your decision to lose the battle but win the war, like Jesus lost the battle of sorts, but he, but he won the war, your decision to do that is filled with the death and resurrection of Jesus himself. Refusing resentment and revenge is not weakness, it's strength. Jesus works through humble, forgiving grace in a divine way that is more powerful than any vengeance you or the movies will ever, ever, ever experience. Jesus lost the battle, but he won the war, and it worked for him. It spared your life. Now Jesus expects you to spare others too. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus' revenge is so strong. It is such a deceptively dangerous lie of the devil that we can get even, that we should get even, even that, that everyone else is getting even, that the movies are getting even. And so we think that we should too, in small ways, in big ways, in emotional ways, in conversational ways, in relational ways, even in physical ways. Jesus, we ask for your wisdom from your spirit that as we face difficulties and injustices, that we understand them rightly. That as we feel wronged by perceived injustices, Lord, that, that you walk with us in the truth and that you help us see it. That when we are actually hurt and that there is pain and loneliness because of real injustice, that our powerful desire for revenge, Lord, is stilled. Stilled by your love, by your words, by your example, by your sacrifice for us. And that by your spirit, you give us the faith to trust in our God to leave room for his wrath 
and to believe that will be better for us. God, we pray for our community. We pray for our world. We pray for nations fighting against nations. We pray for, for ethnic groups and political parties at odds with each other, that, that revenge will be wiped away from the scene and that we can learn to disagree with each other, that we can learn to be different from each other uh, in a way that, that is peaceful, in a way that is even true and loving. We pray all this, God, and ask all these great things, having the confidence that you can and you will answer, and we give you permission, God, and, and want you to involve us in that answer, too. We pray all this in the saving and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. If you live in the Pflugerville area and your kids are ready for something else this summer, check out Camp Cross Life. It's our summer camp for ages 3 to 10, and it runs through August 5th. For more information, go to crosslifepf.academy. I'm Andrew Portnoy, and from all of us here at Cross Life, thank you for tuning in, and see you next week.